from Chesapeake, Virginia, the Lighthouse 100.1 presents Sports Scene. Sports Scene features local, regional, and nationally acclaimed guests and excellent interviews. Follow Sports Scene on Twitter at Greg Bick. Now here is Greg Bickaveras. Sports Scene presented by Hampton Roads Online Mall.com. Of course, may the memory of George Floyd be eternal. Sports Scene Midweek Online, Saturday on the radio and WPMH. AM 1010, 100.1 FM, and tunein.com by typing WPMH in the search bar. Tell your friends about Sports Scene. Twitter at Greg Bick, and you can see the rest of my Twitter handles on GJBTV.com. Thank you to our military and first responders for all that you do during the pandemic and this crisis we're going through as well. Phone line presented by Newport News Creek Festival. It'll be a drive through only, folks, August 28th through August 30th. For more, go to NewportNewsGreekFestival.org gjbtv.com nascar is really the only sport that has started with no fans but they are really unorganized about the start date for all the other sports great interviews excellent guests business segments highlights commentary what teased me off thank you for listening to sports scene we love our regulars and tourists who listen online and on the radio our guests are phil wood from masson and george mclean Stay tuned. Interact with Sports Scene on Twitter at Greg Bick. Email B-I-C-O-G-B at Hotmail.com. Now back to Greg bick in the Hampton Roads Online Mall.com studios. And welcome back to Sports Scene. Every Saturday morning from 10 to 11 right here on WPMH AM 1010. 100.1 FM, tunein.com by typing WPMH in the search bar, and of course on Twitter and YouTube. It's a pleasure to talk to Phil Wood from Masson. You've heard him on the Nationals radio network as well, a longtime broadcaster in the DMV since the 70s, and a regular here. Phil, how are you? Very well, thank you. You know, normally we'd be right in the middle of a, a heavy sports season with uh, the NBA and NHL and, of course, uh, the beloved baseball, but uh, none of that is going on right now. Just crazy that uh, the world has changed since March. Well, it's, it's uh, nothing we've ever lived through before. At least uh, I haven't. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's a kind of a, a bizarre time. I think if, uh, if, if somebody was smart, they would figure out a way to uh, – to score people on uh, on the 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 speed of carry out lines drive throughs i mean it's uh, we're also used to now getting our food uh, somewhere else and not sitting down in a restaurant or sitting down at the ballpark but it's uh, it's a strange time and and uh, it's it's the kind of thing i think greg that uh, we're going to feel the impact for a long time yeah, especially you mentioned some personal stuff before we talk about baseball. Most people do not like to eat in their car. Most people have trouble finding a bathroom where they're out running errands when things are mostly closed, except for grocery stores and some other essential places. So our whole lifestyle has changed uh, before before and after or whatever uh, method we might be operating under. Yeah, it's um, again, it's, it's, it's a strange time. I, I, uh, uh, a, a number of people... I'm sure have probably gained weight from sitting around the house and eating all the time. Amazingly, I've actually lost about six pounds, but uh, that's great. Uh, that's because I've been eating my own cooking. I think but, very uh, good, very good. Well, of course, health is number one and safety for everyone. But um, I tell you, it just seems like all the sports, maybe except for NASCAR, because those guys are just in a car by themselves and their support crew can social distance. It seems like, though, Phil, that the NBA and baseball. And the NHL just cannot get started. No pun intended for NASCAR, but let's just put the key in the ignition. But the players and the owners just can't uh, come to uh, side by side. Well, one of the issues, of course, is uh, is money. But but the other issue is that uh, the great unknown. Uh, who really knows what's going to happen if suddenly you you put these uh, these athletes together in the same locker room where it's almost impossible to social distance? I know in baseball's case, they're talking about. Uh, with no fans in the stands, that they'll seat, seat some players in the stands, um, uh, that each pitcher will have his own set of baseballs, that there won't be any spitting. Uh, I, I think I told you the other day, I, I spoke to our friend Ray Knight recently, and, and, uh, and Ray said, how are you going to get uh, 900 men to not spit for three hours? Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, he says it just doesn't, it doesn't seem possible. But uh, this past week there was a story out of, Japan, where the the Japanese season hasn't started yet, and already some players during the exhibition season have been diagnosed with COVID nineteen. So uh, they've had to get those players out of there and and isolate some other players as well. So 
I think that may be um, a harbinger of things to come. I, I, I'm not real optimistic that they're, they're going to be able to, to restart uh, or to actually start the baseball season. Uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's one of those things that be, because there's no vaccine for what the, the illness is, um, you know, reacting to it is, is, is not going to have any degree of consistency in terms of what really works and what doesn't. Right, because you have foreign players, let's just say in the NBA and Major League Baseball, that might have traveled home. You have no idea who they've interacted with, and, you know, uh, the dates keep getting pushed further and further back. You know, people, the purists, like 162 games, obviously that's not going to happen. But it just seems like we're, we've been on a, a pause that uh, has no end in sight for right now. Well, there's kind of a domino effect as far as the, the, the baseball season goes. If, if uh, obviously, you're not going to be able to play 162 the owners uh, initially uh, projected a 78 to 82 game season, and the players came back with 114 games, and the owners came back with a 50 to 60 game. One of the issues that owners uh, and certainly some people inside the game have brought up: well, if you've got pitchers who are used to throwing 200 innings, and suddenly there's a very short season played, and they're only going to be able to pitch 80 innings, uh, 100 innings, maybe. Well, that's almost like sending them back to the minors and starting their career over with because you have to build up to 200 innings and, and uh, to have a season, you know, almost uh, certainly almost two years before you've seen a 200-inning pitcher, uh, you're asking for some injuries on the backside of this thing. So, it's, it's, uh, again, it's, it's the, the, the great uncertainty, the great unknowns involved in this. Uh, I, I respect the fact that they're trying to get things going, but, I, again, I'm not optimistic. Right. I mean, look at it. You know, you talk about the essentials have been open, grocery stores, big box stores, of course, pharmacies, that type thing. But then again, you see people that uh, cannot go into restaurants because, you know, they don't allow but a certain amount of people in there. So and then baseball players are talking about sitting up in the stands, social distancing, no fans. Uh, you remember several years ago in the Orioles game, there were no fans there because of uh, because of civil unrest. So um, I guess Baltimore is used to it already. They've experienced it during at least one game. Well, yeah, uh, of course we can say, well, the fans have seen this before. Of course, there, there were no fans there, sure. so no one actually saw it. It was on television, but it, it's um, bringing up the Orioles. I mean, there are people inside the game who think that not playing this year is a break for the Orioles because they were so bad the last couple of years, and they don't really have a pitching staff that's uh, that's very um, – that, that, that's really major league caliber that, that not playing a year gives their, uh, gives their fans a rest from another 100 loss season. But uh, be that as it may, it's, it's, it's one of those things that uh, trying to play um, you know, a 50 or 60 game season, how many people would really take that seriously down the road when you have determined a champion, a major league champion based on that few games? Right, talking to uh, Phil Wood from Masson was part of the um, Nats uh, Radio Network. We'll get into that more in the second segment. Uh, Greg Bick of Aris, at Greg Bick on Twitter. I want to thank our good friends at Burger King as well for sponsoring this segment. Eat healthy, but, of course, enjoy Whopper from Burger King as well. Talking to Phil Wood. And, Phil, really, I mean, uh, you know, you talk about dates and the calendar. You're going to have uh, – television networks trying to do all these sports at once whether it's golf in the masters or let's say you know horse racing football basketball baseball it's going to be a total overload if it all does render the way they're talking about well that's true uh, i think there are people in this country who would kind of welcome that that kind of challenge to see how many games you can see in one day or one weekend but uh, it's still going to come, come down to whether or not there's a second wave of the virus. Uh, if there is, I think at that point all, all bets are off. Absolutely. That could happen any time during the fall. Well, let's talk about the Nationals. Here they were. They won the uh, World Series. A lot of people still couldn't believe they did win the World Series last fall. They had a really bad first start of the season. They still finished second to the Braves during the uh, regular season, but they put in a dynamic postseason. A lot of those players are no longer going to be part of the 20 or 21 Nationals team, but it's a shame for them and Rizzo. They were honored by the White House, but they weren't really able to do many curtain calls, at least so far this year? Well, they still haven't gotten their rings. Uh, the rings would have been distributed the second day of the regular season, the second game. Um, but uh, and, and then they wanted to do this virtual thing where they would have essentially 
uh, had someone deliver the, each player's ring to them at, at their home, but the player said, no, we'd rather be all together when that, when that, when that happens. So all those rings are still in their uh, presentation boxes somewhere at Nationals Park, but you know, sooner or later they'll be handed out. Uh, look, Greg, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a bizarre thing. I mean, you go, go back to, this, to the season that the NHL didn't play when uh, there was a labor dispute that, that, that uh, wiped out one entire season. It came back the following year, and it might have taken a few weeks, but sooner or later the, uh, the NHL was as popular as it, as it ever was. I, I think this case is maybe a little different because uh, baseball plays twice as many games as they play in, in, in hockey, and I think it's a, it's a different uh, fan base. But nonetheless, I, I, I think people will respond when baseball comes back. I'm not sure that they're – because – if the, if it comes back this year with no fans, um, I mean you can obviously watch your favorite team on television, but really it's no, nothing's the same as actually being at the ballpark. Um, I know certainly uh, the, the 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 real victims in this are probably going to be the minor league teams, the minor league markets, where they likely won't play any games at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they won't be able to get started. You're right, exactly. Like the Norfolk Tides down here and all the you know, the other teams all around the country because uh, they don't um, depend on television. They depend on fans in the seats buying ice cream and hot dogs and uh, buying parking and everything else that goes with it. And really, you take away that, that element, jobs are lost too. Now, the only thing, Phil, that uh, we got to be cautious as well, when we do come back and let's say there are fans in 20. 20- 21 you know so many people have lost their jobs will they have the discretionary income to go to these games i'm not necessarily talking about washington because that's a pretty affluent market in the dmv but other areas are not as affluent as washington is well you're right about that and uh, i i think the the um the number of teams that have have been proactive and and making sure that um their front office people uh are still getting paid even if if some of them have actually been furloughed from the job because there's nothing to do. Uh, but the, the people who work at the ballparks as vendors, as ticket takers, et cetera, uh, that's lost income for them. Now, many, there's a lot of retired people who, uh, who, who take those, those jobs, and, and they can probably get by um, without whatever little they were making at the ballpark. But there's a number of people who this, is, this, this has been a major uh, life change, change. I mean, when you don't have that kind of discretionary income, now it'll be interesting to see if if baseball makes some gesture, uh, some magnanimous gesture to the fans when it finally does come back on a full time basis and fans are allowed to go to the park again. If there's going to be some kind of a uh, you know a ticket deal or or some other kind of promotion that uh, says you know thanks for sticking with us. Talking to Phil Wood, and we'll talk more about what Phil has been doing since the '70s, and kind of do a reset about uh, last year about announcing his. Um, retirement from the Nationals Radio Network, but still very involved with Mass and still very involved with life and still very involved with baseball and other sports, too. This is Sports Scene. We'll take a short break. We'll come back after these messages. The Newport News Greek Festival will take place August 28th through August 30th on the grounds of Saints Constantine and Helen Greek Orthodox Church. The entire event will be a drive through edition, and we appreciate your continued support. Eat, drink, and celebrate authentic Greek culture on the peninsula. Celebrating a taste of Greece and Newport News with our drive through For more, log on to NewportNewsGreekFestival.org. Opa! You are listening to Sports Scene with Greg Bicaveras. Now, back to Greg. And welcome back to Sports Scene at Greg Bick on Twitter, talking to Phil Wood from Masson, part of the Nationals Radio Network for so many years and very involved with the Orioles before that and, of course, covers everything baseball on the show. Talk about your Saturday show with the former pitcher that you do the show with. Very popular with the emails and the questions. Yeah, uh, in 2011, uh, Masson came to me and they said, we want to start a a weekly uh, Nationals-flavored talk show. Uh, uh, and it'll be Saturday mornings from 10 till noon, and uh, we'd like you to find an ex-player to be your, your, your co-host, but it can't be an ex-Oriole because we want the Nationals to have their own identity. Well, I, obviously there were no ex-Nats in the area. There were some uh, ex-Senator players, but most of those guys were, were up in age and, and didn't really want to do it. Um, but uh, when I was in high school in Fairfax County, at Jefferson High School, uh, 
there was a pitcher at Madison High School named Mike Wallace, who was like the Steven Strasburg of Northern Virginia. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was heavily scouted by several major league teams, and he was offered scholarships by a number of colleges, and he was drafted by the Phillies in the fourth round in the 19. 19- uh, 69 draft, and um, he signed with the Phillies, got to the big leagues in 73, also pitched for the Yankees and the Cardinals and the Texas Rangers. And uh, I'd gotten to know Mike a little bit from seeing him at the ballpark, and so when they, they first came up with this uh, proposal, I, I said, well, uh, what should I, I give a couple of guys tryouts? And they said, sure. So I, I, I called him because I had just seen him at the ballpark, and I said, would you like to do this? Now, I, at the time, I didn't know exactly where he lived. I later found out that he lived about 115 miles from the studio. Mm-hmm. But he said, sure. And um, so we, we did a show together, and he was a little stiff to start with, but then he kind of loosened up. And, and uh, as if you've ever had much experience with, with old left-handed pitchers, mm-hmm. they kind of have their own slant on things. And and I thought he was entertaining, and, and he had great stories to tell. And, and the thing is, he kept up with what was going on in, in Major League Baseball. So I said, well, let's try this again. So we did it again the following Saturday. And really, by the middle of the, of the second show, it was clear that this was going to work out uh, as long as he was willing to make that drive to and from every Saturday morning. So uh, he decided he'd do it. So this, uh, you know, we've, this is our, would be our 10th season. We, we've, we've only been on a little bit uh, in terms of uh, being on during spring training before the show went on hiatus when there was no baseball. But um, Mike is uh, uh, exceptionally knowledgeable. He's, he's been a college coach at both the George Mason University and William and & Mary, and, and uh, uh, he really knows the game. And, and it's so interesting when a club comes in, in, into town, um, w- the scouts that are there, he knows virtually all of them. Uh, uh, so many of the coaches uh, and other managers in the National League, he's either played with them or, or played against them. So he's got some great sources of information, and uh, and so yeah, we this this is our our tenth season, and we're we're we made the uh, we, we had a conversation the other day, and and we both decided that we don't really need games to do a show, but of course the problem is Massa needs tech technicians to to produce the show, and, and sure. so that's not going to happen. So uh, uh, we actually we have a thing coming up, um, which is a, it's almost like a private party. There's a, there's a, a gentleman uh, in Northern Virginia who has had us appear at these luncheons, these baseball luncheons he's had for the past several years. So he's having a virtual luncheon this year. So we're going to be doing a thing with about 50 or 60 people on a Zoom call uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, that, that should be interesting. Right. I do... Um work uh, part-time in sports broadcasting and TV. Of course, my full-time job, as people know, is I produce radio and TV commercials here locally and do a radio and TV show. But I really feel sorry, Phil, for you mentioned Mass and the technicians. They've been out of work for the hockey season, the NBA season, now the baseball season. They relied on those 81 games in Baltimore. Well, not quite unless Fox or ESPN did some. But those guys and gals have lost a lot of work. Oh well, there's there's no no doubt because all of those people are freelance. Yes, and they're paid by the game, and uh, a lot of them, of course, worked on both Nationals and Orioles games. I'd see the same people sure. uh, in the press dining room and in, in in both uh, ballparks. But it, it's um, yeah, the, the, these people are 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 hurt, and I think it's uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, what else can they do when there's no games being played? I mean, I know. For instance, the uh, the gentleman who produces the Saturday morning show for Mike Wallace and I actually works also works at Channel Four in Washington. So he has another job and he just does the Saturday thing part time. But but uh, the people who actually work the games themselves are pretty much, I guess, sitting at home. Yeah, very unfortunate too. And uh, you had mentioned after the World Series, you went out on a swan song, and uh, twenty twenty, you would pretty much um, just be doing massing. But you mentioned about Mike making that commute. He mentioned he still does. You pretty much covered the Orioles well before the Nationals existed, and you had to make that commute from your area in the Baltimore area all the way to, you know, Washington D.C. That's not an easy commute during rush hour either. Yeah, well, I would have to go through both rush hours. In fact, for a number right. of years, of course, I was doing the afternoon show on Mass and the Mid Atlantic Sports Report, and I would, that show would end, and I would run out to the parking lot and get in my car and drive from 
uh, you know, Cockeysville, Maryland, to uh, the ballpark in Washington, and I would usually get there about the third or fourth inning, and uh, then I would catch up on my score sheet and then watch the rest of the game and then do the post-game radio show and drive back home to Baltimore County. So, yeah, it, it, that got to be a little old, and, and that was probably the, the, the biggest influence on my, my deciding to kind of uh, wrap up that uh, aspect of my uh, broadcast career in terms of uh, doing the, po- the national post-game radio. It's, I mean, I, I, I love doing it, and I, I think I've got a, a feel for the audience as, as a, uh, a D.C. native, but um, it's just it's, uh, it was time, and, and sooner or later somebody else was going to have to do it. Yeah, because it's the before and after. I mean, those are late nights. The game goes into rain delay and innings. That Wednesday night becomes dreadful, and you start thinking about that more than analyzing the game. And, um, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, also Charlie Slows. He was the voice of the Tides down here way back in 1986. And you mentioned uh, George Mason. That's the school I went to. And, and i got to give a plug. Bill Brown's been there forever as the as baseball coach. Billy Brown has had a remarkable career. Um I knew Billy Brown when he was a uh, player uh, for Walt Masterson sure. at George Mason. Um, I got to know him through the uh, the SID back in those days, Vince Campanella, mm-hmm. and um, uh, and and Walter essentially picked Bill to to replace him once Bill graduated, and so he's had that job for a, a very long time, and he got it as as a as a young man, and uh, and of course uh, he, he's I, I always. A joke with him. He's like the picture of Dorian Gray. He hasn't aged a day physically right. since he took the job. Right. Um, and the, the last several years, I've I've had the pleasure of uh, emceeing the uh, the George Mason baseball banquet. And uh, and in fact, uh, this this past February, did it with the uh, Dave Martinez, uh, who was obviously still basking in the glow of a, of a World Series win. Absolutely. And of course, uh, Martinez was criticized during the regular season, but he really turned it around. How do you know, what kind of profile is he keeping during this, uh, this extended off season? Well, I mean, he's not spending much time in Washington because, uh, he, he actually owns a farm in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And so he's been, you know, basically plowing the back 40, I guess you'd say, yeah. uh, uh, while no baseball has been going on. He's, um, I mean, obviously, Dave is, is uh, he's a baseball guy, and, and uh, I think he recognizes that um, as the manager of a world championship team, there's going to be certain expectations in the 2020 season, but of course, he's in no position to meet any of those because they're not playing. But uh, some of the things he did last year in terms of uh, taking a 19-31 and 31 start and turning it into a, a World Series championship, uh, it's a great story. I think it's a story people will be, will be telling for a long time. When you consider that it was 95 years between championships in D.C., um, there's only two uh, men who managed World Series champions in Washington, and it's Dave Martinez and Bucky Harris. Right, and the Redskins last one in the 90s, the Wizards in the 70s, and, of course, may uh, Wes Unseld's memory be eternal. Of course, you've been involved in all types of sports in the DMV. Yeah, in fact, uh, losing Wes is a, a really bl- a, a major blow for me because he was a good friend, and, and we had some, some great moments over the years um, at the tail end of his career and, of course, the time he spent as a, as a coach and a GM, and, and of course, uh, Wes never left Baltimore. Wes can made his home in Baltimore uh, from the time he was drafted by the uh, Baltimore Bullets, and of course, they moved to D.C., but he, he never moved to the D.C. area. Um, but uh, a, a wonderful fellow and just uh, one of the most genuine human beings you would ever meet. Um, but he had a lot of health problems over the past years. But no, I've, I was involved with the Bullets uh, doing pre- and post-game shows on WTOP radio, and I was doing the same with the Washington Capitals. And, uh, and then, of course, when I went to Baltimore in uh, the early 80s, uh, I ended up working Colts broadcasts for a couple of seasons and in just two years managed to drive them completely out of town. Mm-hmm. And um, later did some uh, uh, Baltimore Ravens uh, pre- and post-game shows and um, worked with the Orioles uh, a couple of times. I, I did some... Uh, uh, Post, pre- and post-game shows for the Orioles in 87, when the one season they were on WCBM radio. Mm-hmm. And um, I, was, uh, um, I, I did a lot of other stuff for the Orioles. I, I wrote uh, stories for their game programs, and I, 
I uh, did some uh, some uh, emceed some banquets for them. So I had a really good relationship with the Orioles. Right, and I'm sure even though the Nationals were doing well and have done well, not always have done well, they've had a lot of different managers, I'm sure you were hurting deep down inside that the Orioles have been suffering the last few years. Well, I, I could see it coming. Um, mm-hmm. and, and because over the years I've spent a great deal of time with, with Major League Scouts, and you'd sit with them in the uh, in the uh, press dining room, either at Nationals Park or Camden Yards, and, and uh, they would talk amongst themselves about how poorly the Orioles had drafted and, and how uh, uh, you know they, they had not done a good job developing players, and 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 so yeah, you could you could kind of see it it, it, it coming, and and uh, I mean, uh, there's uh, one guy that uh, was uh, instrumental, I think, in the Orioles' uh, successes under. Buck Showalter, but uh, one of their scouts who told me uh, flat out, uh, and I won't quote him by name, but he said, this club won't win for at least eight years. And uh, he was, you know, quite serious. And, and again, he was pointing at uh, things like uh, uh, the scouting department uh, in terms of amateur scouting and uh, overall player development. And, and, And clearly, I think the fans have seen that for themselves. Talking to Phil Wood, primarily we talk baseball. There's not a whole lot of baseball going on, so we're really talking about everything, every spectrum of Phil Wood's broadcast career or what's going on with the latest with the Orioles and the Nationals. You mentioned the Colts, and my dad was a diehard Ohio State fan. I'm, what I'm getting to from 51 to 78 when Woody Hayes especially was coaching, and his last quarterback he had was Arch Leister. And, of course, as you remember, the last few years the Colts were in Baltimore – Arch Leister was the was the quarterback. Um, what a disaster that was! But um, I guess at least one thing: Baltimore has evolved since the Colts left. You know, and uh, even though that blue and white of the Indianapolis Colts is still the same ownership that had it in Baltimore, the same family. You know, uh, the Ravens have uh, moved on. They've won a couple uh, Super Bowls, and you know, all is well again. I hope. Well, of course, one thing to keep in mind, yes, Arch Leister was a high draft pick of, of the Colts sure. and, uh, and, and, and was handed the job at one point, but he lost the job to Mike Pagel. And mm-hmm. technically, Pagel was the, was the, the number one quarterback uh, for the Colts the last couple of years. And of course, the next to last year, they didn't win a game. They went 0-8-1, uh, strike-shortened season. And the following year, they came back and went 7-9 and nine under Frank Cush. But uh, a lot of the fans by that point had so had been so turned off by uh, Robert Ursay that they abandoned the team. And that's, uh, again, this was one of the, uh, you know, foundations of the National Football League in the 1950s. I mean, I had the great pleasure of doing a, a Monday night football show for nine years with Art Donovan and for two years with uh, Johnny Unitas. And, and uh, you know, these guys were, were uh, such idols in this town, yet they, they walked amongst uh, uh, the, the fans. The, the, there was no uh, big me, little you with those guys. No, and people watched um, Donovan on home team sports uh, with um, some TV hosts around. He would always make you laugh. And, of course, Johnny Nice was a legend, and he always respected the Colts, uh, but he moved on to San Diego before the end of his career. But now that Don Shula passed away, what type of relationship did Shula have with uh, Unitas? Not very good. Um, I, I think that um, you go back to the uh, uh, Super Bowl against the New York Jets, and um, they I mean, warmed Johnny up at, 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 at halftime, and he really thought he was going to go in the game in the second half. And uh, they decided to leave Earl Morrill in, and, of course, the Jets beat the Colts that day, and uh, Joe Namath's legend was cemented forever. But uh, Unitas really thought if he played the second half, they would have been able to – come back and win he would have been able to move move the team but working with with Unitas was was interesting on a number of levels because he really didn't like talking about himself Mm -hmm. and and this guy I mean when we were kids and you're playing you know sandlot football everybody wanted to be Johnny Unitas and and uh so I mean he to me he was the NFL in the in the 1950s and early 60s but uh he was a guy who kept up with what was going on in the National Football League on a contemporary uh, basis, and, and I think that uh, he 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 was um, not so full of himself that he had to talk about his own triumphs. He liked to talk about other players. So we would do a show at a local restaurant, and and afterwards we would have uh, dinner together. And he was always very candid, and and uh, uh, but you know fans were always bringing up these games that he had he had played. Uh, during his prime with with the Colts, and and he would always try to change the subject into something more uh, of what was going on now. 
Yeah, I mean, he even talked about San Diego toward the end. As a kid, I don't remember him that much in Baltimore. Of course, I've seen millions of highlights like everybody else has. I remember more Burt Jones and Lionel Mitchell. But he always never threw San Diego under the bus. He always respected the Chargers. Like you said, he always deflected the personality from him. But he really was kind of like the equivalent of a Joe DiMaggio in football. Well, the one thing about the Chargers that he would bring up is that um – the uh, the Chargers had a coach named Tommy Prothrow, mm-hmm. and um, they had drafted um, Dan Fouts. And uh, when Unitas was acquired from the Colts, Unitas was the starting quarterback. He might, uh, I think, it was opening day 1973. The, the Chargers played the Redskins in Washington, and, and it was a 38 to nothing. Redskins victory, and, and the Unitas didn't have much help from the offensive line the Chargers had at that point in time, and eventually they decided to start working Fouts into the lineup, and Prothrow went out of his way to, to tell Johnny, don't, I, I don't want to see you working with Fouts at practice. You know, We want to de- develop him on, on our own, and so Fouts, when practice was over and everybody would shower and leave, would go over to Unitas' apartment, and they'd work out there. They would talk about the game, and so oh. It was like, keep this secret, don't let the coach know. So all, all, all the while while that was going on, uh, Tommy Prothrow was completely in, in, the, in the dark about it. It was just, um, you know, he had something to give to the Chargers, and if it wasn't going to be on the field, then it was going to be off the field. And last few things, you mentioned Fouts. Of course, he's no longer with CBS. He's moved on. He used to work with Keith Jackson at ABC. He was always better doing color commentary than play-by-play. I will say that. Sometimes it's difficult for former athletes to do play-by-play, but uh, he has moved on. But, um, you know, one thing about baseball, the broadcasters get used to their home announcers like uh, the Nationals or any other team. You've seen all the uproar with the uh, Wizards this past year. People did not get over the changing of the guard of the uh, play by play but teams and fans get used to their announcers as opposed to let's say the cbs fox and espn announcers that are pretty neutral along the way yeah i i think that that in fact when uh what i've been doing in the winter time for the past six years is going to my alma mater austin p and and teaching sports broadcasting and one of the classes i teach is called sports and media and we talk about basically the, the history of sports broadcasting and the whole issue of of uh, certain broadcasters become so identified with certain teams, you can never really shake that. So sometimes when a, a guy who's been a local broadcaster for a number of years uh, ends up doing a network game, and the network game involves the team he used to do, there's this bias you can sometimes hear in the, in the broadcaster's voice. But those things I don't think can be... Um, you know, taking that seriously because I think it's just human nature. You you know this team, you know this market. So, uh, but anyway, it's 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 an interesting thing. Uh, the, the 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 network guys who have worked local never really quite lose that local flavor. No, you know, even uh, sometimes years ago for Fox they would use you know Gary Thorne to do the game, but now they've kind of gotten rid of that. They rather use their own people, you know, or you know other announcers too. But a good example of that back in the day, you remember it. KMOX in St. Louis was Jack Buck doing the Cardinals uh, baseball team, but also being a CBS broadcaster as well, doing football and Monday night football on the radio. He was very professional, very neutral, as was Dick Enberg, and both those men have passed away. Well, obviously that that happens to all of us uh, sooner or later, but it, it, in, in the case of, of, uh, of, of Jack Buck, he had such a distinctive voice um, you know, you, you you didn't. He didn't have to tell you who he was. You knew who he was just 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 by his voice. Um, and of course, uh, he his his son is now certainly a, a prominent sportscaster as well. Um, the the uh, the the way that that broadcasting has gone over the years, uh, there was a uh, a really strong push to have um, you know a lot of to get a lot of ex players involved in uh, in doing the games, and I think that, that was a good thing, particularly if they were competent behind the mic. But, Greg, you know a lot of them weren't, and a lot of them didn't last uh, in terms of, uh, of becoming network broadcasters. And, um, you know, sadly, and, and I run into it all the time with, with my, my students, is that there's a perception that, well, if you played the game, you're going to be, you're going to be good at this, and, and, and they'll give you enough time to develop into, into a, a solid broadcaster. 
doesn't always work out quite that way. No, was look at Joe Montana. I mean, he did not work out as a broadcaster, and either did uh, Emmett Smith. And nothing against him. Both gentlemen, both highly respected people. But broadcasting is not for everybody. Phil, all the best. I know we're pushed against the time here for you and your wife, and all the best in health and happiness. And uh, let's hope eventually all sports get kickstarted, but especially baseball here soon. Let's hope so. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Phil. Phil Wood right there from Masson, a true legend in broadcasting. Sports Scene will continue after these messages. Sports Scene, Hampton Roads' premier interview show with Greg Picaveras, each Saturday from 10 a.m. to 11. And you look at that, 4-4 four and four at home, which is just average, 4-3-1 and one on the road. I mean, you're not going to win any games like that. They were not the same team after they beat the Packers, yet the Packers were a totally different team. Interact with Sports Scene on Twitter, at Greg Bick, and listen weekly as Greg interviews distinguished guests with excellent commentary and insight. Sports Scene, Saturdays at 10 a.m. on the Lighthouse 100.1 FM. It's now time for Greg's Highlights, presented by Hampton Roads Online Mall.com. Highlights, GJBTV.com, HRSM, HOF.com, and Hampton Roads Online Mall.com. GJBTV.com, click the YouTube link for archive shows as well as great audio and video content as well. Question of the day presented by the Newport News Greek Festival, August 28th to August 30th, to our steam producer, Colleen, and the general manager. Colleen, is this the worst time in the country's history in your lifetime? I think it is in our lifetime, and I guess maybe because of the situation and being at the age I am and having a child, I think it affects us in a certain way. One thing I can think of that would have been worse with the Vietnam War, but uh, we're having an internal war in the country, and let's hope we have peace and safety and health for everyone. Sports Scene will continue after these messages. The Newport News Greek Festival will take place August 28th through August 30th on the grounds of Saints Constantine and Helen Greek Orthodox Church. The entire event will be a drive through edition, and we appreciate your continued support. Eat, drink, and celebrate authentic Greek culture on the peninsula. Celebrating a taste of Greece in Newport News with our drive through For more, log on to NewportNewsGreekFestival.org. Opa! Catch up on archived editions of Sports Scene by going to GJBTV.com and clicking the YouTube image on the homepage. Now back to Sports Scene with Greg Bicaveras. And welcome back to Sports Scene, our monthly featured guest from the Marksman, George McLean. George, how are you? And hope you're doing well so far in this month of June. Uh, I am, Greg. I hope you are as well. We're staying uh, isolated uh, as, as much as uh, as we can. Everybody is still healthy, so that's, that's a good thing. Before we talk about what's going on in the country, and there's always uh, a lot of room there to talk about a lot of things, what's the latest with the pandemic and how is business? I know the door you know, is still somewhat locked, but at least some restaurants are starting to open up and we're starting to get back to somewhat normalcy. Well, we're, uh, you know, the, the governor's order that that broke out indoor shooting ranges where before it was all classified uh, as, as uh, entertainment. And so we had to abide by all the closure rulings. And so a lot of those still not have not opened up, but they, they he did break out. Uh, indoor shooting ranges, but we're we're very restrictive, uh, or he is. The order is on how we can operate. So we're we're at a fifty percent capacity, so we can only use every other lane to maintain that social distancing uh, between you know customers on the range. Uh, masks uh, are uh, required, and and the door is locked. You just then we got a sign to you know, just you know, tap on the door, knock on the door, somebody. It will come and let you in, and the reason we do that is so we can control, you know, uh, who's coming in under what circumstances. So you have to have a mask. And to be frank, uh, we've gotten just in the last few days some bad reviews on Facebook and whatever, and and people don't go into detail and, and say, well, they wouldn't let me in because they didn't have a mask. And, you know, some of them have, you know, medical issues, and and that's fine, but we're still uh, permitted, and we will to, to for the safety of our employees and safety of other customers. If you do not have a mask, you're not getting in. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you have a medical condition, you probably need to be staying at home instead of going out because 
if you, know, if, if, if you contract this and whatever medical condition you have, if you might be an asthmatic or whatever, and so you, you don't you know, wear these masks, but that doesn't mean that you're immune from spreading you know, this, this virus if you happen to have it. So we're just simply... Uh, are not going to take that chance. Uh, the governor's order, if, if you read the, in, in the facts, it allows businesses to do that. We cannot ask you what your medical condition is. But if you inform us that you have a medical di- condition and you're not required to wear a mask, I'm also not required to let you in my business. And that's just the long and short of it. And, and uh, I, I hate to come across as, as being, uh, you know, but that, that's strict, but that's that's who we are. That's what we are. We have to, you know, maintain uh, our, our presence and abide by the governor's order, and we expect our customers to do the same. Talking to George McLean from the Marksman in Newport News, Greg Picaveras, glad you're with us on Sports Scene every Saturday morning. One thing about this whole pandemic, as far as the rules, every state's different, but in Virginia, it's been very erratic and inconsistent. I'll say this: yes, grocery stores should be open, pharmacies. I get it from the beginning, but then again, you have people that are not social distancing at these big lumber stores. We don't need to mention their names, but restaurants can only have people do curbside and takeout, and now they can sit outside phase two. That we don't have some people that will go inside but that whole number 10 rule of 10 people then you got 50 people 50 percent capacity there's a lot of information george and a lot of people are still very confused oh yeah no i i, I don't doubt that and and we're not again we're not being jerks no. about it we try to inform people and, and do it in, in a nice way but uh we, we've had a couple that wanted to wanted to argue and and start you know cussing at my employees and that's man <laughs> That's just the wrong thing to do at my business. It's not going to get you uh, any favors, I can I can tell you that. Yeah, because those doors will be locked for good for those people. You know, they'll be banned yeah. from the store. <laughs> you can't have uh, looters or troublemakers or, or just people that are loud um, and obnoxious. Not at a gun store, folks. Use some common sense. Uh, George, uh, what's been going on in the country? You know, we saw recently where a father and son uh, shot somebody in another state. And then, of course, this recent shooting as well. And, of course, uh, you know, every life is important. Important and I understand that, but uh, you know it's very unfortunate about uh, police brutality. It's happened, you know, all over the country. But still, I mean, we need to be accountable for ourselves. And and that was an unfortunate incident. It was horrible. It was pathetic. But that does not mean that you can shoot, rob, and of course torture innocent bystanders, beat up people just because of the color of their skin walking by you, or loot buildings. That has nothing to do with police brutality. Well, that, that that's right. I mean, it, it still it still comes down to your res- respecting other people, having some common sense. Uh, you know, treat you know the, the the golden rule that most of us are raised under. I, I, I get it that some people have never heard of it, but you know, treat other people the way you'd like to be treated yourself. I mean, mm-hmm. that's 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 the fair way uh, you know to to do it. And so we've always got and always will have. We've always had and always will have these individuals that want to take the law into their own hands and become the, you know, uh, judge and jury, uh, and in some cases, uh, judge, jury, and executioner. And uh, we, we don't need that, and these people need to be, you know, locked up. Absolutely. And of course, uh, you know, we all are hurting because he passed away, but let's uh, be respectful and have some type of law and order and human decency. Let's uh, let's not have to worry about curfews by each uh, mayor in each city. Let's not destroy buildings. I mean, think about it, folks. Businesses have been shut down for several months. The last thing we want to do is wake up on Monday morning and see glass shattered all over the place. And George, I guess the one thing about it, you hear it from gun owners all around the country, is gun sales are increasing because people are worried about their own personal property because if it can happen at a business, it can happen at an idle home as well. Well, that's, that's exactly right. And I, I don't know what uh, these folks say, think they're, they're, they're gaining. This is some kind of you know, retribution against uh, other innocents for the bad uh, you know, judgment of, of you know, a, a one particular you know, uh, individual. And it just, uh, that, that kind of you know, mob mentality has just never made you know, sense to me. But it's, uh, it's there if it exists. And they, they say they're justified. Well, you're not justified. Uh, you know, it's let let the courts you know do do their job, do their duty, and uh, you know this this individual well, individuals you know two two different instances that, that we're you know talking about here the father son and then you know the 
the, the Minnesota deal, uh, you know, the, 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 our, we have a good system. We have a good legal system. And let it let it do its job, you know. Yeah, and think about it, folks, too, just common sense, too. And I'll get George's opinion. I mean, businesses that are vulnerable and have no protection – from Secret Service or the National Guard or state police or local police or, you know, reserves or whatever. You know, the you know President Trump has got a child that lives in the White House. He's got a staff there. He's got a young wife there as well. The White House is the White House. The, the main job of the Secret Service is to protect the vice president and his family and the president and his family and everybody at the White House. And they put a fence out there. Sure, why wouldn't they put a fence out there? That is not something they want to deal with every night when they got to deal with all these other problems all around the country and looting as well. Nobody should disrespect the White House, no matter who's in that house, Republican or yeah. Democrat. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, I, yeah, every, you know, they, every, all this happens under you know, free speech. We have a right to mm-hmm. express our, our dissatisfaction. And that's right, you do, but do it respectfully. You know, mm-hmm. do it, you, you don't go out and in a destructive you know, way to do this. That that does not accomplish anything, and that is not part of your free speech you know, uh, guaranteed rights. Is to allow you to go out and, and destroy uh, public or private property. You just you can't do it. And let's talk about this too, George. You guys have a lot of police officers that have done uh, practice there as well, and they're being tested. From everything they learned in the academy, they got their shields, they got there's tear gas, there's rubber bullets. I mean, right now the people protesting have, have some have turned violent. There's always that great group that's been very civil and polite, but there's bad seeds in every city that have done looting that have shot and killed police officers because of this the last uh, several days and weeks. Yeah, they they use that as, as their excuse, uh, you know, to go out and do it. So they they feel justified. Uh, for all those you know, actions, but yeah, you're you're right. Uh, I've I've kind of lost count. Uh, I think it's uh, four or five police officers now that's, that's been you know killed because of someone wanting to you know make retribution or take retribution against them for again you know one one bad apple. And uh, I don't, I don't know how you how you you, you would stop it. Well, you know, Trump has tried to bring in and has offered uh, you know to. Uh, activate, uh, you know, National Guard and uh, reserves or whatever, send those in, and then you've got some uh, mayors or governors from the liberal side uh, that are, are refusing that simply because it's coming from Trump. And uh, that that makes no sense either. I mean, that, these, these are brainiacs, man. <laughs> I, I, I do not know how they get to where they are today. Right. Talking to George McLean from The Marksman. George, what are you finding the biggest need for your customers during this pandemic, but also the civil unrest they're seeing in, in cities, not only in the country, but also in Hampton Roads? Well, uh, the, the the one thing that, the, that they need and they want, they can't have right now, and that's, that's the training. And uh, because of the restrictions and the social distancing, you, you know, we and, and the way we train, uh, you know the, the, the fundamentals of, of, of shooting. It's an up close and personal deal. I mean, you're you're you know gripping you know the other person's hands to show them how to you know hold the, the firearm and and then you know get the other stance and just a lot of things. It's not always hands on, but there are several times that it may be when you're correcting a grip uh, and doing it. So we can't do you know any of that. And so that's a, that's a, a section of our business that. Uh, it's not even up to you know the fifty percent. It's at zero because we can't do it. Um, so that that's probably the, the the greatest thing. We're able to get firearms. Uh, that's not a problem. The ammo, some calibers are are, are a little tight. Uh, so others we can get, and that's probably going to get you know, until these factories, uh, you know, federal especially uh, gets. You know, crank back up to full production. Uh, ammo is probably going to continue to be a, be an issue, uh, but that's that's the, you know as far as needs that that's the biggest thing. And then uh, the whole thing is is still as you talked about before. There's some rules and regulations depending on the type of business you go into, whether it's a grocery store or whether it's a shooting range, kind of a deal. And you, and you really just need to you know ask you know questions. How you know what's what's expected. And we have all that on our, our Facebook page. So, you know, a little bit of research, a little bit of homework ahead of time before you come out, you know, will save probably aggravation on, on both sides. We don't mind telling you again and again and again, but if you drive out there 
And you know, if you're not prepared for what uh, is 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 needed, and if you don't have a mask, we'll find one and you'll know, get you a mask. But you got but you got to wear it, you know. Uh, so that's I think just the educational parts of that that's a big thing as well. Right, the biggest deal is yourself when you walk out the door. Your attitude. If your attitude's not right, you're not going to be let into any business. I mean, I've seen grocery stores kick people out because they're cutting in lines. So you can't go there and act like an immature person, man or woman, when you walk into a gun shop or any store. You have to be respectful of the employees and the rules that the owner does and so forth. And I'm glad you talked about equipment. Even I heard on a movie the other day somebody asked about a nine millimeter and a clip so for the people out there that saw that same movie tell the people what is a nine millimeter and what is a clip george well a nine millimeter obviously that's that's uh, the diameter of the of the ammo uh of the round uh in in the metric system in, in millimeters and we 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 always tell people you know clips are for a hair magazines are for guns yeah so when someone says a, a, a clip you know we'll We'll kind of, you know, serious say it in a you know, tactful way. You know, it's, it's it's a magazine. Yes, we know a lot of people that, you know, will, will say you know clips, but the, the correct terminology is, is is magazine. But that's what holds you know the the bullets. It's what holds the rounds, and that's what feeds them into the uh, into the firearm. Right. Uh, so sem- semi-automatics will have you know magazines. Uh, revolvers don't. Revolvers have the cylinder, the, the, the round cylinder. And it's usually a you know a five six or in the case of a small caliber like a twenty two, you could have like a a, a nine you know, round uh, cylinder that, that holds nine rounds. Uh, so they you know, different configurations based on the type of firearm. Very good. Talking to George McLean, final few moments. This is sports scene every Saturday morning. Don't forget to Google uh, and go to YouTube. All you got to do is go to YouTube, type in George McLean sports scene to hear past shows as well. George, what advice would you give to somebody out there right now that is looking to buy a gun for the first time? Well, again, do uh, do your homework. Uh, be, uh, again, all of this, this this pandemic thing has, has changed everything. I, you've heard me recommend on here many, many, many times that you know you can come in and, and, and rent a fire, rent, rent something that is close. It may not be the exact model that you're looking to buy. We've got about I don't know twenty five or thirty firearms that that we had been renting and they're still we still have them but we are no longer renting them because of the disinfecting uh requirements that we have to do a customer comes in and touches something we have to disinfect it so if we had all these rental guns the only way you're going to disinfect it is something that's that's typically that what we're using has got your chlorine bleach in it and uh, we're, we're not going to, you know, it's also can be corrosive. So we're not going to ruin our firearms by disinfecting them, which means we can't put them out for use because if you use them, we got to disinfect. If we disinfect, uh, eventually it's, it's going to destroy the finish on, on the gun. So we're not renting firearms until this stuff is all said and done. So absent that ability, you're, you're just, you're, you're really going to have to do your homework online uh do some research uh talk to you know someone that that has you know shot that firearm and come down and you know talk to us if you don't want to talk to someone in the business if you got a buddy you know that has you know maybe a you know a, a, a nine millimeter glock say uh, you're looking to get a glock uh, 19 and you got you know someone that's got it talk to them get their you know, opinion on it if you've never fired a gun before you're not going to know where to start uh, other than, you know, so you, you look at the size of your hands, the size of the body, your age, uh, and what age has to do with it is, is maybe your typical you know, strength that you've got in your arms. Uh, and it doesn't take a lot, but uh, it, uh, most of it obviously is just, you know, technique. Talk to other people and, and make make the best educated decision you can. You, you can't just go look at a picture and, and say, I, this is the one I want. <laughs> excuse me and uh and buy it and you may hate it once once you get it and if you hate it you, you're not going to shoot it and if you don't shoot it you're not going to be proficient with it uh at that point it's, it's worthless to you right that's the best way to do it is just uh, go by there go by the marksman at 520 industrial park drive buy your product ask one of the employees before you just say i want that because you might take it home and be totally dissatisfied with it. George, give us your hours. I know they've been changing, but uh, they're pretty consistent now, 10 to 6. Yeah, we're, we're opening up uh, at 10 a.m. and uh, close up at, at 6. 
and our, our Sundays, uh, where we're going to reopen, uh, soon on, on Sundays. And we're going to try to go ahead, uh, and start some of our, the, the concealed classes, but, uh, we're going to have to, you know, keep it small by necessity because you have to go in and, and shoot. And again, you're not going to be able to rent firearms when this happens. So you're going to have to have a firearm ready that you can bring in. So that, that will be starting up this month. Where we'll go back to our Sunday hours, which will, which will be from noon until six on Sunday and then 10 to six, uh, Monday through Saturday, uh, until this stuff kind of gets back to normal. And then we'll, Probably go ahead and bump our hours back during the weekday and Saturday till till eight o'clock. But right right now we're going to keep the six o'clock closed. Phone number is eight seven two forty one thirty. We'll talk to him again in July. George, all the best to you and your family for a great June, and glad things are moving forward slowly but surely. And always be safe. Uh, same to you. Uh, stay stay safe. Stay healthy. Uh, my best to you, and we'll look forward to talking to you again in July. And one more thing, too, folks. It's a privilege yeah. to have social media. Facebook is a privilege. It's not meant for to be a vending board about what you like and don't like, whether it's a business. Each business has a prerogative to do what they want to based on the state rules. And really, George, I mean, life existed pretty fine before Facebook existed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree 100%. <laughs> we really didn't need it back then, and we might not need it now. All the best, George. There you go. All right, Greg, you take care. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. What tees you off? Presented by Hampton Roads Online All right, what tees me off? Greg Bickabaris along with Colleen. Colleen, you're trying to have a conversation. You see it, especially the younger generation, and you're saying, oh, well, how's it going? And you realize they can't hear you because they have their headphones on. Oh, that's so annoying. <laughs> Absolutely. Violence and anarchy. There's one thing to protest, but there's no need to ever touch a human being or touch a building. Definitely so. Yes, looters. Oh, I, you know, that. there's no concern, you know, for other people's property. And that's just, uh, you know, it's not the way that we should be. Right. Our own personal property or somebody else's. I know we've gone through a pandemic, but uh, people have lost their jobs. Price gouging is not good by businesses to make up for that loss of business. Oh, the cost of cleaning products has gone sky high. At least we can find hand sanitizer again. There you go. (laughs) All right. The last thing is, again, I mentioned this earlier, no human being should ever touch another human being, but beating helpless people on the streets. Again, there's no words. Absolutely. That's what teased me off. Stay tuned. Mold, trash, rodents, snakeskin, even deceased animals. No, this isn't a Halloween shopping list. It's what might be under your house, in your crawl space. Schedule a free crawl space inspection with the Crawl Space Company and find out what's in your crawl space. Call 757-394-3494 to schedule your free inspection or visit thecrawlspacecompany.net. So, do you know what's in your crawl space? <laughs> Sports Scene, Hampton Roads' premiere interview show with Greg Bicaveras, each Saturday from 10 a.m. to 11. And you look at that, 4-4 four and four at home, which is just average, 4-3-1 and one on the road. I mean, you're not going to win any games like that. They were not the same team after they beat the Packers, yet the Packers were a totally different team. Interact with Sports Scene on Twitter, at Greg Bick, and listen weekly as Greg interviews distinguished guests with excellent commentary and insight. Sports Scene, Saturdays at 10 a.m. on the Lighthouse 100.1 FM. And want to thank our guests today, Phil Wood from Masson and George McLean from more. Log on to GJBTV.com. Let's hope this pandemic ends peacefully for everybody in the country and abroad. And hope we have peace back in our country as well for everyone. Safety and health always number one. For Colleen, I'm Greg Picavaris. We'll talk to you soon. On the next episode of Sports Scene in July, we'll talk to Keith Crockett, dive into the world of professional wrestling at a local, regional, and national level.